Thanks, Renata. Um, I just want to start by saying I think this has been a really amazing meeting so far, and I'm really thankful that we're having a meeting about the Queen. And I want to thank Renata for organizing all of this. It's been great. So like she said, uh, I'm going to talk about some of the work that we're doing in Lethbridge on related to Queens, but more than just talking about research results, I want to sort of take the opportunity to talk about some of the things we don't usually get a chance to talk about, about how we do some of the things and why we do it and how that relates back to the results that we're getting. And I'm going to share my time with Lene, who's sitting over there today, uh, who's a technician in our lab, and so I'm going to be talking about Import, uh, imported stocks and, and some of the ways that we assess them. And she's going to talk about some of the queens that we've been breeding in canola fields in southern Alberta. And I want to continue the theme of sort of making this a dialogue. So if you have a question, go ahead and just raise your hand and we'll address it when it comes up. So what I'm going to talk about today, I have presented on at the AGM before, and it was a trial that we did looking at the performance of imported and domestic stocks in, in colonies in Alberta. And this was in collaboration with the folks at Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada, uh, Abdullah, Marta, and Steve Purnell, as well as the NBDC, Patricia Wolfega, and my lab, uh, Lene and Jeff, who are both here. And because I'm going to share time and hand it over to Lene afterwards, I just want to start by thanking all the people who did this work. So that includes all of the technicians and summer students in the lab, as well as the cooperating beekeepers that we worked with and, and queen producers. So the goal of this project was really to evaluate traits that we can measure on a queen herself and look at those and see if they're related in any way to things that we measure at the colony level when we put them in a colony. So how do traits of the queen, things we can measure in a shipment of queens, relate to colony performance? So in, in, when I talk about colony performance, I'm talking about all different measures of health and productivity, but that can include things like brood patchiness, the brood area, so how much brood is in the colony, what's the honey production, of course, as well as the adult bee population, the defensiveness and hygienic behavior. And you can see in that photo is just one way that we can use to measure populations of either adults or brood. You can see I've got a frame there that we've just put a string grid into. And so that's one way that you can use in your colonies to measure things. So you can compare, see, you know, what's the spring buildup of these colonies by just measuring the amount of brood in them at two different time points. We also wanted to establish some quality control standards for queens. So are there things that we can use as sort of a standard metric to say this is a good queen, this is a bad queen on these shipments that we're getting? And then what Lene is going to talk about is evaluating the potential for queen production um, costs and risks in Alberta and comparing that back to what we're seeing in terms of imports. In terms of queen traits, some of the things that we've looked at relate to this, this morphology of the queen. So how big is she? How much does she weigh? How big is her thorax? How much do her ovaries weigh? Uh, how many ovarials does she have? So in an ovary, there's a number of string-like things. Those are ovarials that produce the eggs, the nutritive cells that feed the eggs. Um, what's the volume of her spermatheca? So that's the organ in the queen that stores the sperm. How big is that? What's its potential for sperm storage? As well as sperm quantity and viability of these queens. So the stocks that we looked at in this particular experiment came from New Zealand, Hawaii, and British Columbia. And I just want to emphasize that stock is not a static thing. It varies from year to year, from batch to batch. And there's a lot of things that go into queen performance in addition to just the genetics of the queen. There's also the care and what she's experienced throughout her life, as well as colony level parameters. But the first thing we did on a subset of these queens was Patricia evaluated their sperm viability. So I've created a pie chart for each of the graphs. And if you look at the light gray bar at the bottom of the pie charts, you can see the mean sperm viability. So for the New Zealand stock, it was pretty good. It was 89% of the sperm was still viable in the spermatheca, 83% for the Hawaiians, and 85% uh, for the British Columbians. But of course, if you're a beekeeper, it's not just the average sperm viability of all of your queens that you're worried about. You want to know, you know what proportion of those are going to be duds. 
So my personal threshold criteria, I, if a queen has above 85% sperm viability, I consider that reasonably good for a queen just starting out her life. But if she's got less than 75% viable sperm, when I'm first introducing her to a colony, I'm thinking she's not going to do that well. And if you look at the New Zealand stock, that percent poor category, it's kind of a yellow or light green color, it's pretty small. So most of the queens were pretty good. It had good sperm viability on average, but there was also few queens that were poor. In this particular batch of these Hawaiian queens, there was a lot more. It was over 20% that were what I would consider poorer than I would like to see in, colony, in queens I'm just introducing. And then the BC stock, again, was, was pretty low, but there was a lot more that were sort of intermediate. So for this, I would say the New Zealand stocks were the winners in terms of sperm viability for these particular batches. Now, one of the other ways that we measure colony performance or try and establish what's going on in a colony is by looking at brood patchiness. And the way that we do that, you can see there's two photos. The photo on the top, you can see a white square of plastic, and then there's a rhomboid shape cut out. And what we do is we take that rhomboid shape and we lay it over the sort of the center of the brood area. And we do that on three different areas. So it could be two sides on the same frame and one other frame or three different frames, but sort of the center of the brood area where the brood is the most solid, we put this rhomboid on. And that rhombus is cut so that it's 100 cells large. And what we can do is we can count the number of misses or the number of cells that aren't kept brood in that, in that shape and we get a percent patchy. So it's an inverse measure to how solid the brood is. So the higher the number, the more patchy it is, and the lower in the number, the less patchy it is. And you can see the bottom rhombus, that's only about 4% uh, patchy. It's pretty solid brood. So we're going to look at a lot of graphs with similar coloration. The New Zealand stocks are going to be colored orange. The Hawaiian stocks are going to be colored green. And the BC stocks are going to be colored blue. And in the first production season of these queens, it's going to be the sort of washed out color. And the brighter color is the second production season for these queens. So the first thing you notice from this graph is that in both production seasons, the Hawaiian queens or colonies from the Hawaiian led queens and the BC led queens were pretty solid in terms of their brood production. They had pretty low levels of patchiness. But the New Zealand's in both years, and especially the second year, were, were quite patchy. Some of the colonies had up to 60% misses in the center of that brood area. So a lot of patchiness, but also a lot of variance in how patchy or how solid the brood was, especially in that second production season. But I've already told you they had really high sperm viability for the New Zealand queens. So that wasn't the issue. It wasn't an issue with shipment that was mentioned, and that can definitely have a detrimental effect on sperm viability. And you would think with the New Zealand's coming so far, they would have an issue with that. But this particular shipment, we didn't see that at all. So that sperm or that patchiness in the brood did continue on into subsequent uh, assessments. So I showed you placing that grid over the frame of capped brood. Uh, we actually also measure capped brood in another way. We can shake the bees off take a picture of the frame, and then we have a computer program that can tell us exactly how many capped cells are on that frame. So that's what this graph shows, is the number of actual capped cells in the colony. And you can see that that patchiness in the New Zealand colonies did, in fact, lead to less brood overall in the colonies, whereas the Hawaiians and BCs were statistically indistinguishable and higher than the New Zealand. And so this continued on into the adult bee populations. This graph is a bit busy, but it shows you the number of adult bees total in the colonies by three different sites and three different socks. So we actually had a site up at Beaver Lodge and then two in the south. So again, the orange bars are our New Zealand stocks. And you, the first thing you notice is that those orange bars are a little smaller. So the adult bee populations of those colonies headed by New Zealand queens were smaller. And the other thing you'll notice is that the adult bee populations in the sites up at Beaver Lodge were higher, and that's something we've seen throughout many, many experiments over many years. Uh, in Beaver Lodge, compared to at Lethbridge, they always have larger populations and more brood area in their colonies. But I think it's really important to note that there's an interaction between site and stock. So all stocks don't behave the same way at all sites. 
And what we saw was the difference between the New Zealand and the other two stocks was larger up at Beaver Lodge where there was sort of more potential for these large populations. So I already told you it wasn't sperm viability that was the cause of this patchiness in the colonies headed by the New Zealand queens. And what we, what we think is going on is that it was actually due to chalk brood, surprisingly enough. Um, if we just look at the colonies with any brood pathogen observed, almost 70% of those colonies headed by New Zealand queens, we did observe a brood pathogen in, and that was almost always chalk brood. There was one or two cells of EFB, but it was almost all chalk brood. Um, in contrast, the BC and Hawaiian queens had much lower levels, 35 or 40 percent of the colonies had some brood pathogen at some point over the two years. Honey production, of course, is very important to all beekeepers. And if you look at the relationship between brood patchiness and honey production, there is a slight negative relationship where if you have patchier brood, you get less honey. But what I really want to highlight for you is this. So if you look at those colonies that are really good performers, the ones that are making 100 kilograms of honey or more, almost all of those are less than about 15% patchy. So if you have colonies that are really patchy, they're not going to be your good performers. Someone, I think maybe it was Olaf, mentioned hygienic behavior. So that test is just to measure sort of the, the behavioral immunity of the colony. So what we do is we freeze a patch of brew, that's what this circle is here, the first circle on your left. Um, that We just take a pipe and we, we pour liquid nitrogen into it and freeze kill the brood and then we put it back in and we come back 24 hours later and measure how many of those dead brood cells are cleaned out. And so what that's indicative of is colonies that are really able to clean out diseased and, and dying brood before they become uh, infectious. And it's actually a really good mechanism of trying to enhance the health in your colonies is breeding for this particular trait. We had an experiment a few years ago up at Beaver Lodge where we selected for hygienic behavior and then we infected the colonies with AFB and we had a significant proportion of those colonies bred for, select, for hygienic behavior that we couldn't give AFB to. Even if we put AFB in the colonies and they were in a yard riddled with AFB, they were able to just clean it out really quick. And you can actually see some colonies within 24 hours, they've cleaned out all the dead brood and the queen has already laid. So that's what you want to select for if you're selecting for hygienic behavior. We didn't see any difference among these particular stocks that we tested in terms of hygienic behavior though yet. And it might be the next slide. Is there a correlation between the hygiene and um, size of the hive? So the question was, is there a correlation between hygiene and size of the hive? It, it seems like the, the bigger influence on hygienic behavior is the season. So if you're in a strong honey flow, all colonies are hygienic. You want to do a hygienic behavior when the bees really have no real strong reason to be cleaning out the hive, and that's when you start to see the differences. And you have to have sufficient population to do the test, but it doesn't seem like that's as important as the honey flow. It's more behavioral. Yeah. Um, and we also saw no difference in the defensive behavior among these particular stocks. And I don't have a picture, but the way we evaluate that is we just take a leather patch and like a long stick. And we kind of stand back and wave it for a minute. And we do all the colonies on the pallet at the same time so they're equally angered by our actions. And then we count the number of stings in that patch. And some colonies won't sting it at all. And some there'll be just like hundreds of stings in this little leather patch. And we do that over you know, repeated number of times and sort of take an average. But generally, I think beekeepers know. Like if you have a really mean colony, you know, and you're not going to breed from it. So someone else, maybe it was Glenn, mentioned queen loss over time. And this is what we found for this particular project. And I think it agrees with what we've been hearing from beekeepers, with queens just not lasting as long as we would like them to. So at introduction, we had 129 queens by the end of that summer. Uh, we were down to about 60, 63% of those queens still left in the experiment. And then by the end of the second summer, we had about a third of our original queens left. And you know, you have to take it with a little grain of salt because we are doing these assessments. So we probably have a little bit higher queen loss rate than a beekeeper who's maybe leaving their colonies alone a little bit more. Um, but I think it's actually not that far off. 
So in review, what can you take home and use? Well, brood patchiness does matter. It leads to reduced adult bee population. We've seen in other experiments that leads to reduced cluster scores. Um, there are differences among stocks in patchiness, but in this case, at least, it wasn't due to sperm viability. The mating and shipping conditions seemed fine, and we think it was due to disease. High honey-producing colonies were less than about 15% patchy and a low proportion of the queens did survive to production seasons. Lene? Yep. All right, thank you. Uh, yeah, now I, we're kind of greatly switching avenues here and uh, talking about some of the queens we were raising in canola fields down in southern Alberta. So a little bit more like Curtis's and uh, Rob Stocks this morning. Um, and I think some of the guys mentioned this. I just have some of the actual data from Stephen Page to back it up, but a really great reason for raising queens here, and I suppose everyone in here doesn't really need to be convinced you're all obviously interested in raising queens here, is that the price of queens has been doubling every 10 years. Um, so this is when they're imported into Canada, the uh, costs are uh, reported at the border. So at the current trend, we'd be paying $66 a queen by 2029. I don't think anyone wants to do that. I also don't think anyone's honey prices doubled in the last 10 years either, and perhaps did the reversal. So. Uh, that's, that's one re reason to raise queens here. Another one is that our queen importations are incredibly reliant on two sources, which is Hawaii and California. And if there's a lot of risk involved with one of these borders closing, and as we've seen in the last couple of years, borders can close very quickly. And uh, the Hawaiian border was actually threatened in 2010 because of small hive beetle. And the Californian border was just threatened last year because of some Africanized swarms getting too close to the queen breeding areas. Um, if either of these shuts and uh, the Canadian bee industry can't get 100,000 queens, uh, it's going to be a big problem. So by producing more queens locally, we, we can definitely mitigate some of the risk associated with the bulk of our queens coming from two places. Um, and then the third reason is just some concerns with shipping. Um, so I, I think our queen suppliers do as well as they can to ensure that the queens are shipped in a, in a good way, but ultimately they can't really control what happens once they get onto an airplane or are in transit. And this research from Jeff Pettis just shows that if queens are held at four degrees for two hours, or if they're held at 40 degrees, for two hours, they basically lose so much sperm viability as to be useless. And those temperatures happen in shipping. Four degrees is around refrigeration often. 40 degrees is if they're left in a hot truck for an hour, right? So um, just by raising queens here, we know that our queens do not undergo these temperature stresses. Uh, and so now I'm going to shift to why we specifically have been mating queens in canola fields. Uh, this is Rolling Hills, Alberta, which is a little bit south of Brooks. And I just have it as a good example of what the canola, the seed canola industry stocking rate looks at. So this is a normal area where you're getting bee yards about every two miles or so. And in this pocket of irrigated land, each of those little green circles is a quarter section, by the way. Um, we've normally got about 20 bee yards, 1,300 hives. And once the bees come in for pollination, we're up to 60 bee yards and 4,300 hives. So if we put mating nukes there, which we did, how many drones will these queens have to mate with? Um, and it, this is a hard question to answer because queens fly varying distances to mate. The bulk of them mate within three kilometers of their hive, but they can go even up to 20 kilometers in one specific instance. And um, 
the drones are also flying in a radius. So in effect, this entire area is important for the mating of these queens. And so if I ask how many drones do these queens have to mate with, the answer is a lot. And if I apply some very generalizing math, there's maybe six and a half million drones in this area to mate with. And that's just complete drone saturation. And what you ensure then is that the queens are always mated very well and there's a lot of competition for mating. So your fittest drones are mating and just with natural selection over time, that's going to increase the productivity of your stock. Um, and so in our product, or in our project, what we did, um, I think in the north there's a lot of beekeepers who queen breed. It does not happen in the south and there's quite a lot of, uh, none of them really want to jump into it and it's a hard jump to make. You know, I th you can't just start grafting in 10,000 cells in a day, you know, it, it takes a lot of work to build up to. So what we did is we used our expertise at Alberta Agriculture to bridge the gap. So. We did the selection and maintained the cell builders, we did the grafting, we transported the queen cells, and then we gave the queen cells to the beekeepers to see how it would work within their canola pollination uh, environment. Um, and so they were introduced into two frame splits in early July. So unlike what most of the guys were talking about this morning, this is much later queen mating. I don't think any of you guys were mating queens in July. Um, but this is when canola pollination happens and when we can actually get those um, really large stocking rates. And then um, we track the hives to see mating success inputs and overwintering success to get some numbers on what kind of, uh, what you would be looking at if you were to incorporate this. Uh, so here's just a few examples. As you can see, weed whacking isn't an issue in this particular uh, situation. And so those are the, the singles on the, the far right that we use for our mating nukes. Um, here's another one. Uh, these, this is actually lentils, but perhaps some weed whacking here might have been a good idea. Um, here's another, another beekeeper with a different color boxes again. Um, and then for our own hives, we kind of tried out a couple different designs. So the top right is just a normal single box that we did the split in. And we've been doing that for a couple of years and we found good success overwintering it like that. Um, but the lovely people in Edmonton had lots of extra nukes for us to try out. So we tried a few different things this year. Um, these are, I believe, what you guys call Taggart nukes um, on the bottom, this pink one. Um, and uh, so we tried those out. I was a bit concerned that they'd overheat in the heat of canola, but they did fine. Um, they're in the wintering building right now. I think there might be some problems with ventilation with them. And so we also had these other, these blue nukes on the left there. Um, they're actually from a Finnish company and they have a screen bottom board. Um, so we probably shouldn't see the problems with ventilation with them but um, they might have too much ventilation on the bottom. They're pretty open on the bottom. And then the bottom other one is actually the same one, but you can divide it in half, so you'll get three frames on each side. Um, this was about the dumbest thing I did the past summer. Um, most of them swarmed. <laughs> it's really hard to manage them that small and try to get them all the way to winter um, when they're um, only three frames and you're putting them through canola pollination season. So th that does not work. Don't try that. It works for a mating nuke that's going to be transferred, but not for a mating nuke that you're going to try to winter and continue to be that small. And just to like feed it is very hard to keep enough feed in it. Um, and these are, they were talking about cell builders. So we just used single, uh, single hives that had been split from doubles most of the young bees remaining in the bottom, and then we took all the open brood <coughs> out. And then I just have some numbers from our year. So we did about 900 cells for grafting, and we got about 71% grafting <laughs> success. Uh, that, that's on the low end of what you would want, um, but we, you, we kind of had a big range between grafts. And then we tracked the numbers, or the, the costs, the labor inputs. And it was about a dollar per cell in terms of producing a viable queen cell. Now that includes all the supplies 
and the labor. Um, it does not include what you would consider to be maybe the loss in honey production when you're using a hive as a cell builder instead of using it for honey, just because that's a really difficult number to calculate and obviously is going to vary across Alberta extremely widely, let alone in southern Alberta. So that, that number is only including the cost of managing the hives and the supplies. Uh, and then in terms of mating success, uh, what you see here is we, we worked with two different beekeepers operations and then the AF is us. And then we had three rounds where I think one of the guys mentioned it this morning, but where they went back and if the cell hadn't take, they would insert a new cell or even in one case a third cell. Um, and so we saw about 90% mating success after the first round and two of the operations, but that third operation took longer to kind of catch up. Um, and then we just checked them again in September um, because often you'll get a few drone layers uh, pop out after you've originally checked them. And um, yeah, including the first two rounds, the, some of them were still near about 90% mating success. And then uh, that other operation was lower again. And we do tend to see variation amongst operations when we work with multiple beekeepers. And so we sent 20 queens for testing up to Patricia at the NBDC um, in t for sperm count, sperm viability. And what we see for sperm count is really, really good. So like I said, there's tons of drones. You're going to get tons of very well-mated queens. So we're looking at 81 million sperm was the average um, with a high range. And as you can see for the imported queens, from 2017, which that is the result from Shelley's, what Shelley was talking about earlier, the average for imported queens was 5.6 million sperm. So our lowest queen here is the same as the average for an imported queen. So that's a really good sign. Um, as you can see for the sperm viability, it's more on par. And this was a weird result given that we had the, di the viability tested in uh, 20 queens in 2018 as well and we had really, really good viability that year. And so what we think what happened with the sperm viability is that we had to ship the queens because <laughs> we didn't feel like driving up to Beaver Lodge. So these queens actually had to be shipped up there and they must have on, undergone some temperature stress. Seems to be fairly likely. So um, maybe next year we'll meet Patricia halfway or something, make sure that uh, we get a good number out of their testing. But it was very encouraging results. Uh, then this is similar to what Shelley was talking about earlier. So these are just her graphs um, from 2017. So the New Zealand, Hawaii, and BC stocks. And then on the side there, you can see our 2018 and 2019 canola queens. So in general, we're getting good sperm count and decent viability, and maybe there's some shipping problems. And so we're going to do this again next year and look at how these queens perform because it'll be their first real production season because they were just mating during honey flow last season. Uh, then um, we will repeat. And uh, as we're talking about queen rearing today, I'll mention that we actually do all of our grafting on the deck of the truck this year. And it seemed to work okay for us, but um, you have to be careful if it's really windy. And is this something that you seasoned guys see much with this kind of queen cell? You grafted a drone on the left. <laughs> that is what someone told me, is that it's most likely a drone. So what happens is the bees keep feeding it, but um, it doesn't really develop. So there's about an inch of royal jelly in there and a tiny larva on the end. And it actually, it wasn't even capped. It wasn't even pupating yet. Only no, no, it, it was like it was like that fat stage of a worker larva before it. Yeah, yeah. So apparently, it could have been a drone. I think it was Shelly. She grafted it. So. <laughs> that's her there. <laughs> yeah, I was wondering if that's how they do royal jelly production. It would be a great way. Um, and I just wanted to refer anyone who's looking for some resources. Uh, they, they created this guide a couple of years ago and it's available at Honey Council and Kappa and it's really helpful um, for looking at the, the state of 
the support of the queen rearing industry across Canada. And I'd like to acknowledge the beekeepers that we work with, Patricia at the NBC and Jeff and Rhonda who help with the research. And uh, take any questions for what I said or for what Shelley said. Good? Yes. Uh, you keep saying it's the temperament of the queen, but a statement was made earlier from someone that it's really the drones that she mates with that could possibly give you either a, a mellow queen or a nasty one.